be fan. And as many of you know or should know, among the various activities that we offer are a couple of very good movie groups. We have lots of activities beyond our study discussion groups for you to participate in. And judging by the enthusiasm that I saw today in the next room, not only for the cookies, not only for the coffee, but for each other, my encouragement is to come as often as possible to in-person events where you can enjoy the Plato community completely. So, without further... I gotta remember what I said. <laughs> without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ellen Haas, who is the co-chair of our colloquium committee. Thank you for being here. I'll see you later. Thanks so much, Steve. It is great to see everyone here. Um, before I start, I want to say one little thing. It's wonderful to be in person, but if everybody, I, I took mine off for a minute, could, be, could wear their mask. Our speaker has asked, she will take hers off if everybody has it on. So um, it would be great. Well, we're very excited to have our speaker for today. With the Oscars quickly approaching, just in a little bit, just a couple of weeks, the Plato Society is thrilled to have Manola Dargis as our speaker. Since 2004, she has been the co-chief film critic of the New York Times. And prior to that, she was film critic at the LA Times. She was film critic at the LA Weekly. But to me, being a bred in New York, the most wonderful thing is that she was the film critic for the Village Voice. <laughs> okay, she wasn't the major one, but it's a major newspaper. Let's put it that way. But she wrote three col two columns on it, um, avant-garde cinema. She grew up in the East Village, another wonderful part of New York City, and after going to Purchase College, she then received an MA from NYU. She's written numerous essays and the book LA Confidential. She's been nominated five times for the Pulitzer Prize for her enlightened movie criticism and her understanding of the business and the art of film. She's widely recognized for her compelling criticism of film's content and performance. She's also widely recognized for the thoughtful pieces about the culture of movies, especially her writings on women and film, which she's gotten a lot of recognition for. I have to say before I give her the mic that I went to her, her Instagram site. <laughs> you didn't know that. And she identified herself marvelously, saying she was a writer, a movie lover, a friend to all animals and some humans. <laughs> and then she put in parentheses, New York Times Phil Curley. We couldn't have invited a better person to speak to us today about the great movies of 1920-22 and forward. I give you Manoa Dargis. No, no, that was lovely. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate everyone's cooperation with the masks. I know it's a drag. Uh, I wear a mask always when I go to screenings. Um, it's just that my husband hasn't gotten COVID. And I'd really like to keep it that way. Um, and so I, if you all keep your mask on, I will take mine off. So just, I think it will be a lot better. Okay. But I, I really appreciate, and I'm putting my hair down, baby. Okay. Um, so you heard the whole spiel. My name is Manola Dargis. Uh, 
I've lived in Los Angeles since 1994. Uh, I grew up in New York City. I started writing for The Village Voice when I was in graduate school getting my master's in cinema studies, which is a pretty ridiculous thing to study in school, um, and an even more ridiculous thing to make your living doing, let me tell you. Um, I, I, so I started at The Voice where the, main, the chief uh, critic was actually Jim Hoberman, the great Jim Hoberman, whom you may uh, know, who's really quite marvelous and has written uh, many books, including on uh, Yiddish cinema. Um, I came out uh, in 1994, one month after the Northridge quake, haha, and uh, was completely like I completely forgotten that there were earthquakes in Los Angeles. I was like, oh no! And the ten was down. It was quite traumatic. Um, but I came out for a job because then, as now, there aren't a lot of um, full-time uh, film critic positions. Uh, so I started at The Voice, and I I was pretty good at it. And after having a stomach ache for a year, I kind of got into it and uh, kept at it, decided not to go on for a PhD, and instead uh, try to become a professional writer. Uh, the, I was really happy to come out to LA. Eventually, after being at the Weekly for about a decade, um, I ended up at the LA Times, where my partner uh, in cinema was the great Kenny Turan, uh, who I'm sure many of you know his name. He's a, a lovely human being. Um, and then, uh, you know, I got the call from the New York Times, and when the New York Times calls you, you, you can't say no, you know, you just, even though you're like, oh, you, 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 they, they, they bring you in. Um, happily, though, I, you know, I was allowed to stay here. I said I didn't want to go to, I didn't want to return to New York, so I've stayed here. Um, when I was asked to, uh, to speak before your organization, I was suggested that I could talk about a, a number of topics, including my top ten. Uh, given that the start of the new year is always uh, pretty slow, we are effectively just kind of waiting for the Oscars to come and come over, and yeah, hopefully there'll be no slap this year. I did, I did think that starting with a top ten was a really, was a really fine idea. So today I'm going to talk about my list and some related issues, and I will also draw um, uh, from some of the uh, work I'm wor yeah, a project that I'm also working on. Afterward, I'm really happy to take any questions that you might have. So um, every year, the culture editors at the New York Times strong arm uh, the various discipline critics into composing a top 10. And each year, I have a hard time selecting uh, my 10 favorites. I see a few hundred movies uh, each year, including at film festivals. And, my, and in my experience, there is usually an overabundance of good and great movies to choose from. This is, has remained true even throughout the pandemic. And it also remains true despite all the bad news that you may have heard about the state of the art in the industry. The movies are in trouble, you may have heard. Movie theaters have closed, movie chains have gone bankrupt. And while the uh, theatrical box office numbers for last year were better than the year before. Both the domestic and international box office are about one third down from pre-pandemic uh, years. That's pretty pretty steep. We are told repeatedly that no one wants to go out to the movie theaters, particularly older people. Everyone wants to stay home and just Netflix and chill. Though good luck finding something really interesting on Netflix, if you ask me. Um, it is easier, though not necessarily cheaper, to, to do so. And the only distracting cell phone that you have to deal with is your own and maybe your partner's. The thing is that moviegoers are actually not to blame for this. According to every reputable industry analyst that I have read, the box office is down because the studios are releasing 40% fewer movies than they did in the years before the pandemic. That is shocking, right? 40%. What they're doing is trying to figure things out. They're, trying to, they're deciding when they're going to take things out of cold storage, when to release things. And they are trying to figure out streaming, which is a big question mark because as someone a uh, close friend of mine who works for a major streamer said, nobody can still figure out how to make money from streaming. So the thing about theatrical box office is that there is an infrastructure there, infrastructure there that has worked for over, you know, for 100 years. 
and it's not so easily gotten rid of. I don't think it should be. I don't think it will go, but meanwhile, there's a lot of uh, confusion and a lot of kind of moving of uh, different parts. However, there is, uh, so again, the, the news is not great, certainly, but it is complicated. I'm always reluctant to make sweeping claims about the movie business, which has a long history of traumatic crisis that it eventually finds a way of resolving. They have survived the transition to synchronized sound. They have survived television. They have survived the end of the old studio system. It is too early to know if they are going to survive the current difficulties, whether the pandemic, pandemic will continue to keep patrons away, and what, kinds of, what kind of impact streaming will finally have on the industry. In the eternal, evergreen words of William Goldman, nobody knows anything still. However, I added the cell. However, there is one area where I am authentically, I am authentically concerned about. Um, it is the future of movies that are not superhero movies, movies that are not comic book flicks, movies that are not big, bombastic, same old, same old spectacles, like the most recent uh, Ant-Man, which I just panned and is opening tomorrow, but really you should just avoid. What is concerning to me are the future, is the future of modestly budgeted, openly intelligent, <laughs> independent movies that are produced for adult moviegoers. And yes, sometimes end up as Oscar contenders. You have probably heard and maybe seen some of the better known examples that were released last year. Tar with Kate Blanchett. She said, about the two New York Times journalists who broke the Harvey Weinstein story. Till, which is a very stirring and moving drama centered on the mother of Emmett Till. Armageddon Time, a family drama from James Gray, local, local guy, lives here in Los Angeles. The Fablemans, another family drama from a little upstart, little guy you may know as Steven Spielberg, right? Lovely movie. Every single one of these movies has has floundered at the box office. And while many of these movies at first opened in limited release, meaning just in you know, a limited number of theaters, the ones that have opened wider, meaning in more theaters, have continued to struggle. In November, an industry expert warned that it was, quote, a scary time for prestige films. He also added, quote, right now audiences aren't choosing to watch these films in theaters. His words were both bleak and prophetic. For example, last month when Tar expanded the number of uh, theaters it was playing in, it made an average of less than $1,000 per theater. That is dismal. And if people don't go to these movies, those movies are going to have an increasingly difficult time getting made. <laughs> it's just the way it works. You need to make you need to have hits so you can finance your next movies. That is shockingly bad. Those numbers for TAR are shockingly bad, particularly for one of the most critically acclaimed movies of 2022, a movie that has enjoyed a great deal of boosterish media coverage and that was on many top 10 uh, lists, including my pal Tony's, A.O. Scott. TAR, as it happens, was not on my top 10, and we can talk about why later. Okay, um, but I had other similarly modestly scaled independent movies on my list, starting with a brilliant Polish movie called EO about the dramatic adventures of a circus donkey. The movie is named for the sound he makes. EO, EO, kind of more or less. Uh, it was directed by the veteran Polish filmmaker Jerzy Skolomowski, who turns 85 this year, long may he reign, and whose earlier films include features like Moonlighting and The Shout. Like most of the movies on my top 10, EO is what we have often called an art movie and is understood to uh, share certain qualities with other movies like it. It is an original work. It isn't obvious. It embraces ambiguity. It was made for adults. EO is, off, is also very beautiful, truly, truly beautiful, ravishing. It's also sad, which makes some people hesitant to see it, I understand. And in its concern for animals, it's overtly political. 
Most of the movies on my top 10 can be considered art films. The trade paper, as I just uh, quoted from Variety, like to, they'd like to call them prestige pictures, which I think is kind of hilarious. I had two French movies on my list. I also recommend these. Petite Maman, which is an enchanting movie from Céline Chama. You may know her movie, Portrait of a Lady on Fire. This is very, very different. The other French movie is Happening, which was directed by Audrey Diwan from a memoir by the recent laureate, uh, uh, Nobel laureate Annie Ernaux. I also included Jordan Peele's fantastically original movie, Nope, from Universal. I think it's my only actually big studio movie. Uh, and an eerie and witty intellectual thriller called The Eternal Daughter from the British filmmaker Joanna Hogg. A thriller from the South Korean uh, director Park Chan-wook called Decision to Leave. And a documentary on the opioid crisis from the filmmaker Laura Poitras, All the Beauty and the Bloodshed. I also included Kimmy from Steven Soderbergh, one of cinema's great chameleons. The most far out movie on my list is an experimental work called Expedition Content which largely consists of audio recordings made by Michael Rockefeller, son of Nelson, uh, during the uh, making of a landmark ethnographic movie uh, titled Dead Birds. Uh, expedition content is a fascinating work. The screen is almost all black while the movie is playing, which freaked me out when I first saw it. I didn't know what to do with my eyeballs. I was just like, what do I look at the whole time? You know, I'm like looking at the floor but the audio track is playing and you're drawn in and every so often there's a little flicker of something on screen. It's a fascinating movie. You'll never see it because I don't think we'll ever play again. Anyway, um, uh, admittedly, not all these movies uh, are for everybody, but like all the movies on my top 10, you know, they really inspired me. They provoked, you know, they really provoked a lot of uh, conversation with, friend, with, with friends. And they made me think a lot about cinema and my relationship to it. Every year, Tony, Tony Scott and I receive some pushback about our lists. Like, why isn't my movie on this? Why didn't you put this on? What's wrong with you people? That kind of thing. We're pretty used to it by now. This year, we received an avalanche of criticism. It was weird. Tony was subjected to uh, a storm of angry tweets um, after Elon Musk, I think you've heard of him, retweeted, uh, uh, retweeted someone else's complaint about the fact that Tony hadn't had Top Gun on his top, uh, top 10. If you know us, there's a reason that top, uh, top Gun is not there, but okay. My list ended up on The Hannity Show. I, I, well, yes, thank you, just, I, I feel your concern, <laughs> on Fox News, which actually dedicated 90 minutes to my top 10. The electronic caption read, the latest antics of the woke left, <laughs> I'm not joking, and the whole thing was identified as breaking news. It was like being in an alternative reality. I mean, I have to say, I wasn't watching Fox News. I generally don't, but you know, I watched it later on, and so I got to see the whole thing. Hannity and another Fox host who had been brought in to discuss the important you know, subject of my list uh, joked about it for a while. Uh, the other guy wondered where Top Gun was, you know, Shades of Elon Musk, um, since, according to him, it had saved the American box office. During the segment, Hannity didn't actually discuss my list. Mostly he just mocked it, that's no surprise. But he did mention a movie, uh, the one movie that I haven't mentioned so far, which is from an Iranian director. And the way he, he presented it was like, she has a movie from an Iranian director, as if it was a crime against humanity. The direct, he didn't mention the director's name, but I will. His name is Jafar Panahi. Hannity didn't mention the following either, that Panahi makes movies that criticize the Iranian government and has been severely punished for the work he has done. Hannity didn't mention that in 2010, Panahi was sentenced to six years in prison and banned for 20 years from directing movies, from writing screenplays, from giving interviews to domestic and to foreign media or from even leaving the country except to receive medical treatment or to make a religious pilgrimage. And Hannity certainly didn't mention that while he and his Fox pal were having a good time joking about my so-called woke antics, Panahi was actually in prison at that time. 
He had been arrested in July 2022 for having asked about the welfare of another uh, filmmaker who is often uh, the subject of government censure. Pani remained in prison until February, uh, until earlier actually of this month, and he's now out, which is really wonderful. He is a great man. His movie is No Bears, and you should see it. And you should never, anytime anyone ever talks to you about the bravery of someone who works in Hollywood, I'd like you to mention his name, because this is a very, very gutsy and brilliant artist. That our list had been targeted maybe should not have been a surprise, particularly given the ongoing and sometimes alarming fights over culture uh, that we're experiencing. You know, initially, I thought it was all pretty silly, and I, I laughed the whole thing off, and I joked to friends that I had finally made it, you know, professionally, you know. <laughs> At the same time, the fact that our top tens had been singled out for public criticism on major platforms, on both Fox News and on Twitter, was, I admit, unnerving. Without overstating the case, we had been briefly dragged into the culture wars which is not what I expected when I put a charming and sad movie about a little donkey on my top 10 list. I would be lying if I sometimes don't worry that the very same thing that, it, that is happening in this country with books might happen with movies. You know, the industry did something very smart and we can argue about this, when it decided to create the Hays Code um, and, and self-regulate uh, because it was worried about official censorship. And so it instituted the Hays Code. It had many, many, many problems, which is why there are so many twin beds in movies and why there's no interracial romance for you know decades. But it was a way of the industry kind of protecting itself. And I do worry sometimes that given the climate uh, that we are, that movies might be next. I mean, I don't know if that's alarmist. In any event, the fact that a militaristic movie like Top Gun become, can become a cause celeb, for goodness sakes, and there are filmmakers like Jafar Panahi actively resisting totalitarianism is certainly worth consideration. So movies are political, and they're political in different ways. For example, to return to my top 10, it wasn't until after I compiled my list for 2022 that I realized, to my surprise and my deep satisfaction, that half of the movies on my list had been made by women. As a rule, I only select my absolute favorites each year. I do not select my favorite movies by women. I just say, okay, what are my favorites? And I hope for the best. Um, but suddenly, here were all these women which was something that has not often happened, if at, at all. Yet, last year, as I, I recently wrote about this for a cover story for Arts and Leisure, I realized that I was seeing more and more and more movies by women, which was really exciting and inspiring and really, frankly, quite different from what I had been experienced the previous two, three decades. The fact is that while American women love the movies, the movies do not always love women back. This much has become clear to me after more than three decades of writing about movies, although I wasn't always outspoken as I am now about the price of my movie love. As a young writer, I often talked about movies and sexism with friends, taking my arguments public only when I felt that something important was on the line, as with the anti-feminist nonsense that greeted the release of Thelma and Louise. I was angry a lot. I'm, a, I'm a tired mostly now, but there's still anger. To be a woman who loves movies, I learned, is to constantly be torn between love and betrayal, desire and disappointment. The movies sell women out. So you either give up on them or you learn how to navigate their contradictions. You pay attention, you write, you keep on writing. And if you really care, you look at history. Everyone knows the story of cinema, the story of cinema history, or at least a version of it. Men invented the movies. Men built Hollywood. Men ran the studios. It's a familiar litany of achievement that has been richly documented and widely disseminated for almost as long as movies have been produced. The names of these men adorn the bookshelves in my home office. Print the legend, 
The Life and Times of John Ford, Howard Hawks, The Gray Fox of Hollywood, The Art of Alfred Hitchcock, Hitchcock's re-released films, Hitchcock's films revisited. I love Hitchcock. I love many of the directors enshrined in these books, although that love is often complicated and sometimes fraught. I own about a half a dozen books on Hitchcock and his films, about the same number that I own on Orson Welles, another favorite. My shelves hold other film books, certainly, including cultural histories, production studies, and star memoirs. As you would expect, the objectives of these books differ, as do their methodologies, their politics, and ideological bent. But what unites them is that most of them are about men. I do have books about women, mostly stars. I own four books on Betty Davis, for example, along with Lillian Gish's really bizarro memoir. I have a biography of Hattie McDaniel and another biography of Anna Mae Wong. I have far fewer books on women filmmakers. The books that I own about men in the industry are, on, of course, more numerous, and they are more diverse than the ones on women partly because men have assumed a wider range of roles throughout American movie history. I have books on studio chiefs and producers, writers and agents, exhibitors and various fixers. Some of these books are meant to entertain, others to instruct, some emphasize personalities, while others focus on aesthetics, form, technologies, cultures and practices. Taken together, the hundreds and hundreds of film books I own along with the ones that I've borrowed from the library and the many articles I've read in newspapers, magazines, blogs, and academic journals tell the same story. American movies are made by men, are about men, and for men. For a long time, I accepted men's domination of movies as just, well, reality. It was the air that I breathed. I knew that sexism was somehow, probably, yes, to blame, of course, but that didn't explain the how or really the why of sexism. The fact that I knew and accepted that sexism exists may seem like I had gone through the process of grappling with gender inequality, but that's not the case. It is more accurate to say that I saw sexism as a given. So when I watched these films, just like when I read about these films, I just accepted the unchanging idea that men made the movies that women starred in, right? On occasion, a woman was responsible for the beautiful clothes worn by the beautiful stars. The costume designer, Edith Head, for example, was among the first women in film whose name I recognized, who herself was not actually a movie star. For the most part, the, division, the gender division of labor that played out in film after film was so familiar that I didn't think about it. This gender balance was unfortunate and sometimes infuriating, but you know, you just get used to things. <laughs> um, but it was the way it was. That remained my thinking even as I became aware of exceptions to the Hollywood rule, like Dorothy Arzner, one of the few women who was directing during the so-called classical era. It remained my thinking even when I was immersed in feminist film criticism while earning my master's in the late 80s. In grad school, I read a lot of feminist theory while reading and watching movies by Orson Welles, Ziga Veritoff, Douglas Sirk, etc. Most of the women I read about while I was getting my, my degree were either Hollywood stars or an abstraction called the audience. Mostly women were a blur. By the time I finished grad school, I knew nothing and had read next to nothing, had been assigned absolutely nothing on Dorothy Arzner. I also knew little or nothing about the lives and work of other women who in the years since have become extremely important to me, including the French cinema pioneer Alice Guy Blachet, who was, one, was among the very first people to actually make movies. I didn't know about the great um, writer, director, Lois Weber, who at one time was considered, I kid you not, the equal to D.W. Griffith. I didn't know about the Hollywood star turned director, Ida Lupino. I knew her movies, the ones she made, for instance, with Humphrey Bogart, but I didn't know about the movies she actually directed. I didn't know about the independent filmmaker, Shirley Clark, the documentarian, Madeline Anderson, or the writer-director Elaine May. I knew that women made movies, but I really just, it was just a vague thought. I really didn't understand what they had done, what they had gone up against, and what they had actually accomplished. My lack of knowledge wasn't my fault, or at least not entirely. There was simply not much writing in English, for example, on Alice Guy Blachet, 
who is who made her first films in France in the late 19th century while working for Goma, where she actually ran the studio. Later, after she and her husband moved to the United States, she actually quit her job to accompany him. He got a new job. Goma uh, wanted Herbert, the husband, to uh, promote some products in the United States, and so Herbert left, was, went, and Alice, like the dutiful bourgeois wife that she was, you know, quit making movies and accompanied him, and then she was just kind of sitting around twirl twirling her thumbs for a while. But she didn't stay idle for long. Uh, once they moved to the United States, uh, it was only a few years that she decided, you know, I think I can start making movies again. And she ended up building her own studio in that former uh, center of American film production, Fort Lee, New Jersey. She helped invent movies as we know them, only to disappear from history. For, you, for years, I had no idea that she existed. One problem, which shows how old I am, is that the first time I attended grad school, there was no internet like we have now. So there was no way that I could just you know, click and search like you can now. Instead, my awareness of, film, of women filmmakers as individuals, as a group, as a subject of interest, only began really when I started writing about movies. I have a few personal milestones uh, that helped shift my understanding about women in movies. In 2001, when I was working at the LA Weekly, uh, I noticed that there were a lot of new movies about prostitutes, which just confused me. I mean, there were just a lot. Um, films about sex workers have been around as long as cinema itself, but I was puzzled by this little wave of movies, which ranged from genre fair to art house offerings. I wondered what filmmakers found compelling about these new pretty women. So I did what I do when I'm always curious, I started working on an article. I interviewed different people in the industry and I poured over the box office numbers and read the trades. And as I worked on the story, I wondered what had become of the kind of women I had watched when I was growing up in New York in the 1970s. I've been a movie lover my entire life and I loved old Hollywood um, stars like Barbara Stanwyck and later stars like Ellen Bernstein, performers who taught me that women could cry but also be tough. By the early 2000s, while I was working as a film critic, I was watching, you know, two to three hundred movies a year, and for the most part, I was watching movies ab about men, week after week. I was witness to what I think of as a representational crisis that I didn't really understand, but had become the norm. I finally finished my article on all those movies with prostitutes, but months after it was published, I kept returning to a conversation that I had had with the screenwriter Scott Frank who at the time was in the middle of writing Minority Report for Spielberg. I forgot how I got his contact information, but whatever the case, I guess that a hot screenwriter like Frank, who he also wrote um, Out, of, uh, um, Out of Sight, I think, am I getting the name right, the, the Soderbergh movie? Um, anyway, I figured that Frank might be able to tell me what Hollywood really thought of women. With bracing admirable candor, he explained to me that for the industry, women generally serve, quote, no narrative purpose other than to be the girl. Women in American movies, Frank continued, quote, amplify the male's characteristics, his lack of commitment, whatever it is. He's messy, he's sloppy, he's greedy. Women are there just to sort of help out. There's someone to talk to a step up from the dog, unquote. I don't, I don't, and I just want to say, I don't blame him at all. I, I think this is just remark, especially if you know anything about the industry and how people never say anything really of consequence on the record. It's all like off the record, off the record. I thought this was astonishing that a, a major Hollywood writer, someone who's critically acclaimed, incredibly respected, who was for God's sake, working with Spielberg at the time I interviewed him would be so honest about what he saw as the industry's attitude towards women. I was incredibly grateful to him and that he was really upset that I quoted him as, even though he said it was okay to go on the record. Anyway, um, later, after my article was published, I heard, you know, I, as I said, I heard that he, Scott was unhappy because he didn't want his, his um, honesty to be misread as approval. <laughs> I was really sorry about that. 
Um, but here's the thing, he was right. Things have improved dramatically, I think, uh, in the decades since I talked to Frank, largely because of the increased pressure and activism from women. It's just, that's what it is. It's pushback from women who have really, really tired of this. You know what I'm going to say, of this nonsense. <sighs> women are still working and struggling to tell their stories. And though I know I have a reputation for being a kind of killjoy sometimes, as well as a very mean critic, I would like to leave you with a really happy, positive story. One that gives me hope, and that I hope also is, you find inspiring as well. In 2013, I wrote Ava DuVernay a short email asking if she would agree to an interview. I had just started working on a new article, which turned actually into a series of articles on women directors for the Times. My editors came, had come to me and said, Manola, what's the problem? Why aren't women making movies? Write about it. I'm like, okay. So I did. I realized that I needed, that I could, you know, throw around a lot of statistics, dry numbers, and, you know, shake my shake my fist and finger in the air, but I really wanted to humanize the story, um, you know, to kind of move away just for the, the grim statistics. I had read that DuVernay was shooting a movie for Paramount about Martin Luther King, so she seemed like a promising subject, partly because we have a few uh, friends in common, uh, which might make her more accessible than would be otherwise. So I asked my friend, <laughs> I asked our mutual friend for, her e for DuVernay's email, and I just, wrote her directly out of the blue, asking if she would uh, be interested in talking to me. If possible, I wrote, I would also like to, you know, love to visit the set while you're still shooting. I thought, why not? You know, said, let's see what happens. I assumed that she'd be too busy to respond or would pass my request onto a studio representative. But literally, because I have counted this, 22 minutes later, she responded to my email. Quote, on bridge shooting now, unquote call you on lunch, about an hour, unquote. She is a dynamo, that woman. I had visited, uh, so I ended up going, I, I convinced my editors that I could visit, uh, I could go to Selma, you know, like basically for no money, and uh, by the next day I was on a plane and I was driving, kind of <laughs> thinking, where in the hell is this, this shoot? But I found it. I had visited enough movie sh shoots to know that this kind of quick response from a filmmaker is highly unusual. And, and also just have to say it freaked out uh, the Paramount people who did who really wanted to contain everything and control things as they do. They were very freaked out that suddenly I, I magically, your Times critic appears on the set. Anyway, DuVernay was directing a sizable movie with many intricately moving parts, but she was also very unusually a seasoned film publicist. publicist. In answering me, she was doing what she had done for many other filmmakers. She was handling a journalist and serving her movie. It was my first experience with DuVernay's hands-on approach. Looking back, I understand that she was playing a long game, even if she and I did not yet grasp what that meant. The series I were, was working on for The Times was about the frustrating, seemingly intractable hurdles that women directors have long faced in the industry. Over the past few years, as I've said, women have made extraordinary gains, no question. When have, women have helped run the studios for decades. They've been producers and a handful, including Catherine Bigelow and Nancy Meyer, for example, had been able to regularly direct sizably scaled movies. Yet while women were making movies, including those loved by critics and audiences alike, this support did not really translate into meaningful change. The numbers of women directing each year rarely budged above the seven, eight, nine percent of the total, America, of total movies made. And most of what women did direct was small independent fare. It was confusing. Women made movies that were good enough to play in prestigious festivals like Sundance or Cannes, movies that won prizes, even distribution deals, Women were really well represented in documentary, I think perhaps because the budgets are, tend to be smaller and the stakes are also comparatively smaller than those uh, you know, working, let's say, in the studio. And also you can just pick up your camera and, and go, and just, you don't have to ask permission. But overall, women really remained under underrepresented in narrative fiction. 
Certainly by 2014, when I first emailed Durvene, progress seemed stagnant. Women seemed stuck. I'd been writing about women for so long. I, inter I interviewed, I think, oh, more than 60 uh, uh, people for this series that I did for the Times. I read a lot of history. I scanned all the, the really bummer statistics. But the, the, the harder and the deeper I dug, the more I, I went over everything, I really, this is really when I started to understand that this was not something new and that women had been actually sidelined, marginalized for decades. They had helped invent movies and then they were systematically pushed out. I'm not saying that there's some sort of like secret cabal or anything, you know, there's a bunch of guys with big cigars in the back rooms going, yeah, that little lady, she'll never get a job. That's not what happened. It's a much more complex and kind of boring story about capitalism and, and gender. But really by the 30s, Arzner was the only woman uh, producing, uh, who's actually directing in Hollywood. There were women making movies, uh, some documentaries, some avant-garde work, the people like um, uh, Maya Darren, for example. Shirley Clark starts to make movies in the 50s, independent. But by and large, women were really shut out of the kind of the mainstream movies, which are what most people watch. So that's why it's so important. Anyway, during one memorable meeting uh, with DuVernay at her home, not where, which at the time she was living really close to the Hollywood sign, which I loved. She recalled how her life had changed while she was working as a publicist in 2004 on Michael Mann's thriller Collateral. One night, while the production was shooting near downtown Los Angeles, she was watching Mann work, and suddenly she realized that she wanted to make movies. Quote, I have stories, unquote, DuVernay remembered thinking. So, she made her first movie shortly thereafter. It was a short movie called Saturday Night Live. She made it with $6,000 of her own money. And then she was off and running. She'd wanted to tell her stories. And like so many women who have come before her, many lost to history, and many who are right now changing the face of the American movie industry, she was telling her story. Enough so that finally, when I sat down in early December of last year, half of the movies on my top 10 were made by women. Yes, French women too, but by women. Sean Hannity didn't notice that, but I really wanted you to know. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manola. You really gave us a window, not only into films, but into making films and who makes them and when they make them and how they make them. And, and it's you're a pouring out. Okay, bye. I know. Thank you. And yes, thank you. Bye. And now is an opportunity for the audience to ask questions. Dave will be standing up there with the mic. And people line up, give Manola your questions. She's happy to answer them. Take and a shot, whatever you want. If you, and I have a really, I have a law, I have a big voice, so good. You know, I think. Okay, that's right. I'm, oh, he's going to. I'm here, I'm here. here, I'll give you that back. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's so nice. It's like a, it's like a game show. Right. Exactly. Donnie. Come on down. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, sir. If I may ask. Yes, uh, you may. Uh, since there are critics, top critics, who allegedly are very proof, pro very intellectually and, and uh, educationally prepared, uh, there should be some similarity maybe in what they choose as top films, but there isn't much. So I'm wondering if it isn't some personal issues that get into their critiques. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, but it's all personal, isn't it? Of course, I mean, people, I've had people uh, ask me to be objective, which I, I don't really understand 
I, 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 liter I literally don't understand that. Like how I, I can only be me and my subjectivity and I'm going to talk. And I would actually say that there are a lot of movies, Tar, for example, is a movie that was on many, 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 many top tens. You know, it was one of the most critically acclaimed movies of last year. Uh, nope, uh, Tony Scott and I both had nope. So I think that there are, you know, I think there, there certainly is consensus on certain things, and I, but I often think it's much more interesting when there isn't consensus, you know, and somebody puts something really freaky and far out on their list, something that you, you didn't expect, something that you may not have even heard of. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that part of what you want from a critic? Is for them not to just tell you about the movies you do know, but tell you about the movies that you don't know, right? Should I hold it? Okay. Hi, I've been following you since the LA Weekly, and I'm God bless such, you. such a pleasure to meet you. You're wonderful. Why didn't you like Tar? Uh, Ah, uh, okay. You know, I, I, no, I, I wanted to like it. I always want to like movies. I mean, one of the things that I truly believe as a critic is that you should always walk in with an open mind, you know, open eyes and open heart. And so I walked in really wanting to. I, I like Kate Blanchett. This movie was just a little too actorly for me. So I don't know. I mean, why didn't I like it? I don't know. I didn't believe it for a single second. And then I burst out laughing in the big climatic scene. So it was like, I was just doomed. You know, I, I, I don't know. I, I real, I'm going to watch it again because I actually, unlike Pauline Kael, who always insisted, and I do not believe her, that she only watched a movie once. And why would you only watch Wizard of Oz once or Singing in the Rain once? What the hell? Um, I'm going to go back to Tar, and maybe, though unlikely, I will change my, my mind. <laughs> I know, I know, but I'm trying to be open-minded about my open-mindedness. Give, give us the pluses and the minuses of women talking. Well, there are a lot of women talking. <laughs> I like a little bit more cinema in my movies. What can I say? Boom. I'm here all afternoon with these people. Uh, we've all heard the stories about first movies of a director being made by... I can hear him. Be, being made by uh, breaking open the piggy bank, a collection from friends. But after they get over that, and they make the next movie, uh -huh. the movie after that, how do they get them financed? How do they get them financed? Yeah. I think there's a big, I think they do a little voodoo, magical, woo-woo-woo thing. I, I literally don't know. It really depends. Um, and one of the interesting things, and you maybe are tired of me talking about women in film, but too bad, um, is that women have a much harder time getting money than men do in terms of financing. There's been actual like studies done on this. You know, it really, really depends. It's, money is a weird, is always weird, and it seems especially weird to me in the movie industry. There are people who are very rich who like throwing money at movies, which seems to me like playing the slots, you know? I mean, okay, it's your money, but uh, it really, it's not like, I mean, one of the things about the, the old studio system before 1948 is that it was this really kind of neat little circle. I mean, you know, it was really not kosher and it was against the law, but basically you released a movie and made money, you owned the theaters and then you took that money and you made your new movies. And so um, 1948, the government uh, basically has the studios get out of ex uh, exhibition and so it becomes more and more difficult and you have the rise of the independent producers. So it's just a lot of people with a lot of money shuffling a lot of money around. It's really difficult. I am not an expert on it, as I think has, is pretty obvious from how I'm talking, but I have a sense that it's just a lot of like wishful thinking. And people, you know, there's old, there's kind of standard things. They want to like, you know, have sexy ladies around them and like, you know, show up on TV and maybe even want, you know, the red carpet. I mean, it's just... Uh, there's a lot of ego involved, and people have a lot of money. What can I say? It's kind of weird. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I want a quick question on Tar, because the uh, director, Todd Fields, has only done three movies in his life, and the first two and now the third have all been nominated for Best Picture and Best Director. And I don't know whether you've factored that into your thought. And the second question before you answer, is can you explain everything everywhere all at once? 
Uh, no, I, uh, I'll, take, I'll take question number two. Uh, no, I cannot. Uh, you know, I like that movie, or I liked it for about an hour, and then it just seemed to be repeating itself, and I don't really understand the hot dog fingers. Um, but, you know, I was excited that people liked it. You know, yay, people like movies, yay. I'm always really excited when people go to the movies. I want the movies to succeed. I want people to see movies, especially in movie theaters. Uh, I don't really think about, whenever I think about movies, their quality, whether I like them, how they work, whether they not, uh, their award, uh, you know, possibilities, chances never comes into play. I have a, a kind of lifelong love-hate relationship with the Oscars. I watch them every year, usually while screaming at the, at my television. Um, but, you know, I also know that the Oscars can make careers. And I also know, for example, that when Catherine Bigelow became the first woman to win the Oscar for, di uh, for directing, that made a difference. You know, she made a war movie, The Hurt Locker, and people were like, oh, wow, women, they, they, they can direct, like, with guns and, and, and... I literally had a woman executive tell me that women could not direct action movies. Literally, this is when Catherine Bigelow was making movies. I mean, it just blows my mind. So it's not just men. It's a mindset, you know, about what women can do, what a director is supposed to look like, who a director can be. But that mindset is changing. Well, I, I, don't, I never think about the, uh, I never, I don't look at movies and think about their value vis-a-vis -vis the Oscars. It's just not interesting to me. I have no idea. Maybe he was busy doing other things. I haven't really followed Todd Fields' career. He's not really in my pantheon. Um, I, I have, I liked In the Bedroom. You know, I think that's a solid movie. Um, I really, you know, I think he's very good. Uh, well, he was very good with the actors in that movie in particular. Um, Sissy Spacek and Nick Nolte are, I think, quite excellent in, in the bedroom. Um, it's just, uh, don't really have much else to say about his oeuvre. I'm sorry. Don't, don't, don't hate me. <laughs> I knew it's like a little stick. I know I was being kind of naughty. I apologize. Yes. Hi. Ah, yes. Okay. I like the donkey very much. <laughs> I, what can I say? I like donkeys. My favorite. <laughs> well, in your opinion. Exactly. And that's all we can do, right? Is share our opinions. My favorite movie, by the way, <laughs> one of my favorite movies is uh, uh, also has a donkey in it. It's by uh, the French filmmaker Robert Bresson, and it's uh, uh, Ahazar, uh, uh, Balthazar. And uh, so yeah, I have this kind of weird thing for donkeys. I like to look at donkey videos on Instagram. You, I, you are an animal lover. <laughs> no, I have not seen. There, apparently there's a, another movie with a donkey that I need to see, so. Okay, that's great. Okay, she is, it's just that not this way. You have to kind of hold it this way, kind of like you're singing. Hi, yes, I can. But you can put, if you want to drop it, just to talk. Hi. Oh, you know, I think you may have to press it. Is that what it is? Is it? Oh, yeah, there we much go. Amazon Prime and, and Netflix produce movies that, you know, sometimes they're streamed and other times they appear in the theater and both. And I was wondering how the world of streaming, because sometimes you have small screen and, and large screen film, how does that affect your criticism? Uh, do you and the TV critic have to sit down and say, I'm going to take this film, I'm going to take that oh, film, no, no, or how no, does, how no, does no. that work? I don't, I don't even, I, I greatly admire the TV critics, but I'm a movie critic. <laughs> so, and I'm old enough to believe that movies should be seen the way that the filmmaker wanted them to be seen, which is on the big screen. So I do not you know, uh, review from uh, links or you know, that's what we get now as opposed to DVDs. Um, the only time I did was actually in 2020 when the theaters were shut down and I had to stay home. And it was just such a drag. You know, I, I have, we have a lot of windows in my house. So I like was hanging like, these black curtains over my windows and like, 
yelling at the cats to leave me alone. I mean, I was just, I was struggling, I tell you, it was very hard. But um, once I got vaccinated, I started, and the you know, screening room started, they reopened, I went and start, I watched movies. So I always, I just believe that's, you know, they were made, if they're made to be seen on the big screen, even briefly, that's how I'm going to review them. So. Okay, so even if they both open the same day, yeah. streaming and on the big I screen. See it. I like, there's all sorts of things. I like the big image. What can I say? I like that very much. I also think that there's this thing about when you're in a movie theater, the movie is kind of, kind of gripping you and has your attention mm -hmm. and it's kind of controlling you in a way. At home, you have your little remote, let's pretend this is a remote, and you control it. You want to pee, so you hit pause. You want to go, you know, get a little snack. You have to feed an animal. You have to do whatever. Someone's at the door. You know, we are kind of casual about it. And I think that when you watch a movie that way, you're actually missing the movie. You know, movies are, are good movies at least, have been composed a certain way, they've been edited carefully, they have rhythm and nuance, and I believe that if you start doing that, you're kind of re-editing the movie, among other things. Um, and I just think that I much prefer just seeing it completely. It's like, you know, I, seeing a great painting. I mean, you can look at it, it's nice to look at the little, but it's also nice to see the whole thing, isn't it? Th thank you, I'm also a big screen fan. <laughs> We still exist. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, I'm okay. Um, well, somebody beat me to it, but I did want to know what did Banshees not have for you that was made it not on your top ten list? I thought it was nice. I'm not a huge McDonough fan, the director. You know, I, I like him. I'm not. I think he's. I think you know. I think that that movie really kind of floats along on the charm of its two lead performers and the donkey of course and i think that i just find it a little too tidy a little too neat a little too cute it doesn't quite work for me i like the movie please you know i don't don't but why do you even mention you judge uh if i'm getting it correct correctly that you judge on the director and not just the film what the film is no i always do i'm just saying that in general i'm i just tend not to be a huge fan of his work it was just uh but i always look at the movie because did that flavor your i i try not to i mean but i'm a human mm -hmm. being so you know things okay. happen um but i do always like my great example of this is i think you should again as i said earlier you should always walk in and hope for the best and really keep an open mind. And you know, you can be very surprised as I was when I went in and saw a Ron Howard movie I liked. I mean, you could have just knocked me over. I was just so shocked. But you know, for me to go in already prejudiced against the director is not fair. But I also believe it works both ways. I really, really admire many of uh, Martin Scorsese's movies, for example, but I've also panned him. You know, and which was first time I hit him or his movie. His movie. Okay. The first time I did was very. Uh, I see that you're playing little games with. No, me. no, no. <laughs> but the first time, Probably. you know, I when I showed up when I first started at the New York Times, uh, one of the f first movies I had to re uh, review that year, unfortunately for me, was The Aviator. You know, and I was just like, oh my God, this is totally dead. You know, and I was so upset. Oh, I was so upset, you know, how could I possibly, like me, new critic at the New York Times, pan the great Martin Scorsese. I wrote my review and that night, you know, I finished it, I went out and watched it again, and I thought, oh yeah, I'm totally right, and I just filed my review, you know, and never looked back. And you know, the sad thing is I heard through the grapevine that Scorsese thinks I don't like him. That's a really difficult thing because among everything else, again, I'm a human being, I have favorites, those things always work in. Sure. I have since given him many good reviews. Whether or not he's changed his opinion, I don't know. I prefer not to know what the filmmakers think. And the last thing yes. is, please, this is, I'm asking for a friend. Uh-oh. Uh, as a film, to get in the mindset of a film cri critic, if you um, are an unknown, and we get your email, not you in particular, but I have sent emails to other people, no response. How many emails does a critic get a day? I don't know, but I get hundreds. Hundreds. It's horrifying. 
most of them I'm just like, delete, 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 delete. Um, in terms of movies, I don't, if people just cold write me and say, can you look at my movie, I'm not going to do it. I'm going, I don't really, I don't have the time and I need to see things that are actually being released because I'm super, super busy. You know, I reviewed, I have three reviews tomorrow. Like, that's unusual, but that's just, I'm busy. So it's very difficult. Oh, of course. Hi. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion lately about whether a part in a movie, if it's a Hispanic person, has to be played by a Hispanic actor or actress and that type of thing. What is your comment about that and do you think it's going to become more prevalent, that type of discussion, or sort of die away? I don't think it's going to die away. Um, my hope is that as people get more, you know, particularly people who have been marginalized in the industry as Latinos have been throughout movie history, that they will just, as a matter of course, get the roles. You know, I think that honestly it's not, I'm really of two minds and I, I think it's okay to kind of not really know what you think. I think that if there is a Latino performer who is, you know, capable of doing the role, why not give it to that Latino performer? But I also feel like artists should be able to have latitude in terms of what they're making. You know, I, I don't want to be prescriptive, but I'm not necessarily sure I am the right person to make those judgments. I think those are things that have to be worked out in the industry. I do feel really, really strongly that people just need to have more opportunities. The thing about diversity, you know, and, and we can, you know, have all sorts of very high and noble ideals. But the thing, one thing about diversity is it's more interesting. It is very freaking boring to see the same movies about the same kinds of people all the time. Believe me, as someone who has reviewed endless movies about a boy's own story, I am super not interested in seeing those, but I will still go to them with an open mind. So when we talk about diversity, it's not just about checking boxes, you know, political boxes. It's also about making more interesting art, you know? So again, I think these, these are really difficult conversations, but I think you need to have them. And I think we have to listen to our friends, you know? I think we have to listen to our friends who, in my case, I have a, an Asian American friend and she just schools me all the time and we have really difficult arguments. And sometimes we have, you know, we end up a little teary, but it's really great. I have someone who I trust, who I can speak frankly with, and who can speak frankly with me. Okay. Hi. Uh, one benefit of streaming for me and for a lot of people in this audience is closed captions. Yes, I totally uh, hear is you. Is there any solution? for that See on more the big foreign screen. language films. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, you know, I mean, I use, uh, we have it, we just bought a new sound bar for our television, but I still will tell my husband, would you turn on the captions? Because I have literally no idea what's going on, usually because it's, it's not, it's less our TV, but how the quality of the broadcast, and sometimes it's the sound mix, you know, so we do turn it on. And I often actually walk around, I, I, I wear headsets if I'm by myself because I find it a little easier to hear things. You know, my hearing is actually really great, but it's just, uh, you know, you're not alone. But again, foreign language cinema. Yeah. <laughs> Solves the problem. Hi. Hi. I'm wondering if the trend to have more female directors continues, say, for another 10 years or more. Will the movies in the future, because of the, you know, more women there, will they be different than they are today? What are the different sensibilities between women filmmakers? It's only going to be about menstruation and menopause. <laughs> it's just non-stop <laughs> movies. About, no, um, I don't actually think so. I don't actually believe that there is a different. I mean, I, I would point to someone like Catherine Bigelow as who's like one of the greatest action directors, you know, contemporary American cinema. That, that women, like men, make a range of work. If they have often made smaller movies, kind of dialogue-based movies, it's often for the same reasons that a lot of um, indep you know, in independent male filmmakers have done the budget. You know, they actually don't have, they don't have the money for the cranes and this and that. So 
I think that as women get more and more opportunities, we're going to see a variety. I mean, the women, uh, the Woman King, for example, last year was a big rousing, you know, epic adventure with a lot of like awesome violence. Um, I hate violence in real life. I love it on screen. Don't even. It's a contradiction I can't even deal with. But I, I think we're just going to see more and more women. You know, as they get opportunities, they're going to kind of explore and not and, and do all sorts of things. I think it's really exciting. You know, and I and I hope everyone is looking forward to it as much as I am. Thank you for what you've talked about, but you haven't mentioned the performers very much. Okay. You've talked about directors. Yes. And many times movies get made because of the artist who's performing in them. And I'm wondering what you feel about that and some that you might favor over others who make movies. Oh. Okay. And then I have a follow up to that one. Okay. Um I love actors. I acting is I think I think like a lot of American uh, critics, I'm probably a little auteurist based, uh, for better or for worse. Uh, and so I do think a lot about the, film, the filmmaker, but I of course think about the performance and I love writing about acting. It's not something I'm great at doing, um, but it's something that I really try to do and kind of dig in and think, what is this person doing? Um, I'm really influenced by my friend, the film critic Amy Taubin, who I met at the Village Voice and continues to write for places like Art Form. She had been a, she had been an actress actually, had been on Broadway, and so she's really taught me a lot about acting. And I've read Stanislavski, and I've read other things, and I just, I really do try to attend to the acting as much, you know. But each movie, and each movie review is different, you know. I don't have a template for my reviews, you know. I basically try to seize on the thing that I find most interesting and then go from there. I mean, sometimes I forget to say the most interesting thing and then it's in print and I'm like, oh, damn. Um, but I just, I, I try to just come at it from what I think is the most interesting angle. Um, and yes, you know, certainly with some movies, uh, maybe a lot of movies, um, they're going to get financing because of the performer, of course, uh, for better or for worse. You know, I mean, sometimes you look at a movie and you're just thinking, oh, I know that person's very popular, so I'm seeing them yet again. Um, so, um, but yeah, of course, acting is very important. And I think, I think all of us should write about it more. Do you, is, there, is there a film or is there an actor that you will go to see in a movie simply because of who the back performer is? Um... I really kind of see everything, though. I mean, okay. I, I see so many movies, and I, I, I'm not going to movies necessarily for specific directors or, 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 act, or actors. I'm going it because it's open, and I feel like I need to see it. Like, I want to see every or most of the movies put out by the big studios. I want to see all the movies that all my colleagues are talking about. I mean, again, I see hundreds of movies. Um, there are certainly actors that I very, very much like, you know, who I who I have saw, you know, fond, I'm very fond of. Others who I feel are a little tiresome. Um, I've changed my mind about some actors. You know, I used to not like Ethan Hawke, and then huh. ended up really liking him. You know, I think he changed. I changed. We both changed. We grew older. What I, what I, I don't know what happened, but Ethan and I, we've been on a journey, and now and now I'm very happy to see him. So. Well, here's a closing question for you. We just lost an icon. And they use that word frequently now in the, anything you read about her. Raquel Welsh. Ah. Do you oh, have yes. any thoughts about when her? When did she die? Today? Yesterday. Oh, yesterday. I, I totally missed it. I'm sorry. I was out 82 deadline. years old. Oh, wow. You know, she was a... What's that movie with BC in it? 10 million years BC. I, I think of her unfairly as in a fur bikini. That was like such an image from the 60s that I remember. Like my dad had a, yeah, worked at a bookstore and they always had these posters, you know. Uh, she was a bountiful woman, what can I say? She was, a, she was an interesting movie star of a type you don't really see anymore, you know. It feels like, you know, the Gina Lola Brigida is her, I mean, you know, it's, it's very interesting. I didn't realize she had died. Um, I liked her. I think she had a, a light touch, you know, and I think it can be very, very difficult for very beautiful women in the industry. And I think she managed to kind of finesse her way around that. So um, I feel like I should go home and watch a Raquel Welch movie. <laughs> so thanks for letting me Hi. Hi. Oh, hi. hi. <laughs> I want to thank you for your presentation, for your honesty. Uh, you've got 80 people here who will be interested in going to the movies. If you had two movies that you would like us to see, 
I'm going to put you on the spot. Go, vault. Um, Can you send us to see two movies okay. that are currently out? I just reviewed a movie. Well, of course, see all, any movie that's on my top ten, you should definitely see. A lot of them are, uh, I think at this point, are streaming. Um, but I just reviewed a movie I like very much called Emily, which is a really interesting mix of fact and fiction, uh, and it's about Emily Bronte. And it's just, I really was entranced by it. Um, I think that Bronte fundamentalists will not like it because it takes, you know, it takes liberties. Um, but I just think I really like it. I really like it because the the director, who is Frances O'Connor, who is actually um, an actress, and she uh, was a star of Mansfield Park, the Jane Austen movie, 1999. Um, what she's trying to do is kind of understand uh, Bronte's sensibility. How did this woman write that novel? You know, and so she's really trying to get at a world, a mindset, a milieu, a temperament, and I think she really succeeds. And there's a really steamy little romance in there, which is always a little nice, you know? Em, uh, Emily gets her bodice ripped, so to speak, you know? And I was like, I'm okay with that. Maybe it didn't happen, but I'm okay with that. So I thought that was really good. Lord, what else is open? Is there anything that you want? If you throw me a title, I can be like, I can answer, but I off the top, I'm- Talking women. Oh, God, no. Not a fan. What the hell? That movie? No. Women talking. Women talking. As I said, a lot of women talking. Um, anything else? Okay. A, <clears throat> a question about film critics. Oh, yes. Uh, oh, you can't hear her? She's very loud. Can't hear me? Okay. Okay. You went to NYU, you got a, a master's at NYU film school. How many, is, is that sort of de rigueur for critics to oh, have God, this no. academic background in filmmaking? No. no, in fact, it's quite, I think it's more unusual for critics to have that. And uh, I actually also am all but degree uh, at uh, UCLA. I went, I went, I had a little, cri a little like hmm. midlife crisis a while ago and went back to grad school. Um, I, you know, um, and I, I didn't write my dissertation, but I did all the coursework. So, yeah, yeah I just, I'm really, I, I really like being a student, I guess. I don't know what I, what can I say? Well, we all do. That's why we're in Plato. So, um, because you did go to film school, do you get any deference from filmmakers that other critics do not have? I don't, I, I don't think so, but I don't. I don't really have relationships with um, film directors. I find it better not to know them. I kind mm -hmm. of I avoid parties. I had a horrible experience when I first moved to Los Angeles. I didn't really. I like knew two people, mm -hmm. and so one of those two people invited me to a mm -hmm. uh, to a party, and I was like, I don't know anybody. Sure. So I, I showed up at the party, and I'm like kind of wandering around, and this friend said, Oh, let me introduce you to. And as I'm shaking hands, he mentions the director's name, and I have panned at, and both the director and I like pulled our hands back like that. It was just, and I thought, I'm never going to another Hollywood party. It's horrible, you know. So I, there's like a Chinese wall between. I would. I like to think <clears throat> that I want to just know, but I want to just mm -hmm. review the movie, not my feelings for the filmmaker. One last question. Yes. Is Alec Baldwin ever going to work again? What? Is Alec Baldwin? I doubt. I, I sincerely doubt it. Okay, boys and girls, we did another one. Okay. Thank you let's, so much. Let's thank, let's thank Manalo for not only being so enlightening, but being open and taking your questions. And next time. Um, next month on March 30th, it's Jane Fonda, oh. and, and she's going to be come? sure. Oh my God! I but love she's you so much. yeah. Oh, good. And she's talking about climate change and what you can do. How can I act? Her book. Um, it should be a wonderful time. She's but today pistol. she is, and you were too. Oh, okay. Fantastic. <laughs> okay.